Welcome back to the next video, everybody. Today, we're going to be looking at what I'm calling Proposition 4 and Route to Proving R equals T in the Minimal Case. This is going to be a long one. Buckle up. Let's get to it. <clears throat> we'll start with what I'll call Lemma RQ. Keep all the notation of the previous few videos you might want to review. So Lemma RQ says the following. Um, if you take a set Q of primes that um, are all like equal to one mod L and are given representation row bars unramified at them, then if Q is a prime in big Q, then H0 QQ add 0 row bar is equal to H0 QQ add 0 row bar 1, the Tate twist, and those are both just K. Furthermore, the H1, the flat classes of QQ add 0 row bar, and the flat classes of QQ add 0 row bar 1 are also K. So all of four of these things are just K. Uh, two, RQ, the universal type Q deformation ring, can be topologically generated as an O algebra by the cardinality of Q plus the K dimension of H1 Q, Q add 0 row bar 1 elements. And then three, if H1 empty set, Q add 0 row bar 1 is isomorphic to the direct sum over all primes Q and Q of H1 Q Q add 0 row bar 1, then the cardinality of Q is the K dimension of H1 empty set Q add 0 row bar 1. And now RQ can be topologically generated as an O algebra by just the cardinality of Q element, so it's simpler. Okay, so another thing to keep in mind is sometimes we might call this H1 FQ add 0 row bar, and this guy might be called H1 FQ add 0 row bar 1 respectively, and, and similarly for the H0 groups um, by a slight abuse of notation. So the proof is pretty simple. Uh, we first claim that Frobenius set Q acts semi-simply, so that just means diagonally after a possible extension of scalars, on add 0 row bar, and it has eigenvalues x1 and x inverse for some x in k bar that's not 0 or 1. Indeed, we're given that Frobenius set Q has two distinct non-zero eigenvalues. Let's call them A and B. So the matrix operator given by conjugation by row bar of Frobenius set Q on M2 FL bar is similar to the diagonal matrix with diagonal entries A over A, B over B, A over B, and B over A, which we might just call 1, 1, C, and C inverse for some C not equal to 1 by distinctness of A and B. We are only interested in the action on the trace 0 subspace, so since L is odd, we can simply remove the scalar subspace to consider this action, which really just gets rid of an eigenvalue of 1, Okay, which leaves behind eigenvalues 1x and x inverse, let's say, for some x in k bar that's not 0 or 1 as desired. So my x here is just my c up here. Okay, and then all of this uh, continues to hold for add 0 row bar 1 because q is 1 mod L um, by definition of capital Q. Um, and that really just tells us that the mod L cyclotomic character is trivial on GQ, and that's all we need to get this to continue to hold because the Tate twist kind of doesn't affect things if the mod L cyclotomic character is trivial. Okay. So um, the claims about H0 follow immediately, okay? And then as for the claims about H1, you really just need to recall from like chapter four, for example, you can see lemma one there, that the cardinality of the unramified classes uh, in H1, so the H1 unramified classes, and we are working with the unramified classes here by our definition of Q, is just that of the cardinality of the full H0, but we've already proven the result for H0, so we're done. So part A of the result follows, and then, Part B and C follow immediately from part A and from proposition two of this chapter, so a couple videos ago. And so I'll let you write that down. That's just kind of a go back and do it thing. Okay, so here's the big result of the video. Proposition four, keep all the usual assumptions on row bar. So I think he's like our plausibly modular representation or whatever. And uh, L will be an odd prime, like it's been for this whole chapter. Proposition 4 says that if L is the field uh, Q adjoin the square root of negative 1 to the L minus 1 over 2 times L, then row bar, when restricted to the Galois group of L, is absolutely irreducible. Then, if that happens, there exists a magic number R. I like to call it the magic R. So it's a non-negative integer R, such that for any N and N, there's a finite set of primes Q sub N with the following four properties. No matter what N is, the same R will work for each N. If Q is in Q sub N, then Q is 1 mod L to the N. That's the first property. Up next, if Q is in Q sub n, then row bar is unramified at Q, and row bar of Frobenius at Q has distinct eigenvalues. These conditions should sound familiar, given what we've been talking about. Here's the big one. The cardinality of Qn is always R. And then R sub Q sub n, so the universal deformation ring associated to this set of primes, Q sub n, can always be topologically generated by R elements as an O algebra. Again, this R is independent of n. That's kind of the magic of all of this. All right, so let's get into the proof of this. This is quite difficult. Uh, the claim is that if you take R to be the K dimension of H1 empty set Q at zero row bar one, then that works. By lemma RQ, it suffices, given a natural number N, 
define a set q sub n such that if q is in q sub n, then q equals 1 mod l to the n. That's just the first condition from the last slide unchanged. If q is in q sub n, then rho bar is unramified at q, and rho bar for Benius at q has distinct eigenvalues. That's also just the second condition on the last slide. And then three, this is where it changes. H1 empty set q add 0 rho bar 1 is isomorphic to the direct sum over all primes q and q sub n of H1 fq add 0 rho bar 1. That condition changed, but we're allowed to change it to this by this claim up here, so part three of lemma RQ, okay? So that's this condition here, essentially, which says we really don't need this anymore, we just need the cardinality of Q sub n. Uh, what else? Okay, now, since each of H1 of the QQ adds zero row bar ones is one-dimensional, which we proved already, this last condition here can actually be weakened to just, well, all we really need is an injection going here, okay? Um, because these guys are all kind of one-dimensional, right? So we just have to find an injection from this kind of uh, empty set cohomology group into this direct sum. So let's do that. To this end, we just have to show that for each non-zero, I guess, like cohomology class bracket psi and h1 empty set q add zero rho bar one, there's a prime q that depends on that class such that q is one mod l to the n. Rho bar is unramified at q, and rho bar for Benius at q has distinct eigenvalues. These things don't change. The third condition changes again. It says that the restriction to the kind of um, q condition of bracket psi is in h1 fq add 0 rho bar 1 is non-trivial. Okay. Um, the point is that each successive choice of q reduces the dimension of h1 empty set q add 0 rho bar 1 by 1, and it will annihilate it after r steps, and so you'll be able to produce this injection here. Okay. Um, I guess like... I guess we can continue to say more. Like, we can keep rewording these three conditions in more ways. So, for, for example, by Chebitar of density, it now suffices to find sigma in the Galois group of Q, such that sigma restricted to the Galois group of Q adjoined sigma sub L to the N over Q, where zeta sub L to the N is a, an L to the Nth root of unity. That's trivial. Two, add zero rho bar of sigma has an eigenvalue other than one. And three, psi of sigma, where psi is the guy we took the cohomology class of last slide, is not in sigma minus one of add zero rho bar one, okay? So for example, if I was able to find this psi, then this last condition evidently implies that the Q restriction of bracket psi is non-trivial for a suitably chosen prime Q. And then what about these guys? Uh, well, the point is that the Galois group of Q adjoined zeta sub L to the N over Q is isomorphic to Z mod L to the N Z cross via the cyclotomic character. And so a given sigma is mapped to an, the integer m mod l to the n such that if zeta is an l to the nth root of unity, then sigma of zeta is zeta to the m. That's how the cyclotomic character works. And so you just have to remember, like, under this identification, Fabini set q is mapped to q. And so if we satisfied one, condition one on the previous slide, um, we could find a prime q such that sigma was Fabini set q, and its image would simultaneously be one mod l to the n and q. So q would have to be one mod l to the n, which was condition one two slides ago. Okay. And so that shows that this kind of matches up with this. All right. So how about the second condition? Um, we explained the first and the third condition. What about the second condition? If k is a field with characteristic not two, um, then a matrix M in GL2 of k acts on the three-dimensional space V of trace zero, two by two matrices by conjugation. And the characteristic polynomial of this endomorphism is x minus r, x minus one over r, x minus one where r is the ratio of the generalized eigenvalues of m. We used this fact actually earlier uh, in this talk up here when we were writing down this diagonal matrix. Okay, so we've already actually kind of used this fact. Um, and what? And let's see. So because of that, this matrix m has distinct eigenvalues if and only if the endomorphism of v induced by m has an eigenvalue other than 1. Right, by this expression here. But that's exactly what we're claiming is true here. Or essentially what we're claiming then is like, if this happens, then this happens. Okay, but that's what I'm trying to show, right? So really, I just have to find these, I just have to make sure these three conditions hold for some sigma and GQ. Where is Chebitar of density being used? It's being used to think of sigma as like a Frobenius element, essentially. Okay. All right, so I think we can actually get it. So now we've like written down concretely what we have to show. Let's actually show it. 
Given a non-negative integer m, let f sub m be the extension of q adjoined zeta sub l to the m cut out by add zero rho bar, let's say. Um, what we mean by that precisely is that fm is the field fixed by the kernel of the Galois action on add zero rho bar, restricted to the Galois group of q adjoined zeta sub l to the m. To be clear, like, from this definition, maybe it's not that clear what f zero is. It's just the field fixed by the element of gq acting trivially on add zero rho bar. That's all it is. And so my claim is that psi of the Galois group of Fn is non-trivial. To prove this, it suffices to show that uh, H1 of the Galois group of Fn over Q at 0 rho bar 1 is trivial. Um, the reason for that is, like, we already know bracket psi is non-zero overall. So if this guy is trivial, then this guy must be non-trivial. Okay. So uh, basically, we're going to have to show this in kind of several different cases. So let's do that. Uh, we're going to need an inflation restriction sequence. You should go back to chapter four and review that material if you don't remember how that works. Here's the inflation restriction sequence I'm going to use. Zero to H1, Galois group of F0 over Q, to add zero rho bar one's Galois group of F0 invariance, to H1, Galois group of Fn over Q, add zero rho bar one, to H1 of kind of the quotient, uh, Galois group of Fn over F0, add zero rho bar of one, and then take the GQ invariance. So this is a, a kind of a straightforward inflation restriction sequence. Now, F1 over F0 is an extension of fields of degree co-prime to L by definition, and since the Galois group of Q acts trivially on Galois group of Fn over F1, uh, the reason for that is it acts by conjugation, and Galois group of Fn over F1 injects again by construction into the Galois group of Q adjoined zeta sub L of the N over Q, on which GQ certainly acts trivially, so this is true. Uh, we find by chapter 4, for example, that H1 of the Galois group of Fn over F0 adds 0 rho bar 1's GQ invariance. In other words, this guy here. Okay. He's just homomorphisms from the Galois group of Fn over F1 adds 0 rho bar 1's GQ invariance. Okay. Remember, that's because like this general theme in, in group cohomology is that H1 is just homomorphisms when the action is trivial. So, uh, um, uh, and then like GQ does act trivially on Galois group of Fn over F1. And then what's left, what's left might be like F1 over FQ, but that's an extension co-prime to L, so there's nothing interesting happening here when we consider that piece of, of the cohomology. Okay, so since rho bar restricted to G sub L is absolutely irreducible, that's given to us, the group of GQ invariants on the right-hand side here, so this guy is trivial. Uh, you can see a quick proof of that, for example, in CSS page 441. I don't want to get that far afield here. It's not that hard to show that. Okay, so this guy is trivial in that case. On the other hand, the Galois group of F0 acts trivially on add 0 rho bar, and that's by definition of F0. Okay, so the first term in my inflation restriction sequence also vanishes, unless, unless what? Unless Galois group of F0 over Q has order divisible by L and has the Galois group of Q adjoined zeta sub L over Q as a quotient. So in other words, this guy is usually trivial, unless, like, the exact things needed to make it non-trivial happen. Okay. Um, notice that the Galois group of F0 over Q is isomorphic to the projective image of rho bar, and the reason for that is the kernel of the map from the image of rho bar to the image of add 0 rho bar really just consists of the scalars in the image of rho bar. Okay? So to continue, we're going to need the following theorem on finite groups that I'll call Dixon's theorem. It says if H is a finite subgroup of PGL2 of F bar L, then one of the following three things holds. Either H is conjugate to a subgroup of, uh, the upper triangular matrices, or H is conjugate to PSL2 of F sub L to the R, or PGL2 of F sub L to the R for some natural number R, not to be confused with the R that we're using in this, the magic R, okay? Or H is isomorphic to A4, S4, A5, or D sub R, again, not to be confused with the R that we're, we're using the magic R in this proposition. D sub R here, by the way, is the dihedral group of order 2R for some R not uh, bigger than 1 not divisible by R, just so that the notation is clear which dihedral group we mean. I won't prove this. It's written up very well in Dixon's Linear Groups with an exposition of the Galois field theory, sections 255 and 260. Um, there's all kinds of places you can read about this. Okay. All right, so let's keep going. So what, what do we have so far? This guy is trivial. This guy is usually trivial, right? And this is the guy we're trying to prove is trivial. So let's go. Let's let G tilde be the image of rho bar, which is, this. let's say, the Galois group of M over Q, where M is the splitting field of rho bar. You can maybe even take that as the definition of M in this case, is that this is true. Okay, and we'll let G be the image of add zero rho bar, which is the Galois group of maybe N over Q, where N is the splitting field of add zero rho bar. 
and we'll let z be the kernel of the map from g tilde to g, which is the Galois group of m over n, which is, as we just got done talking about, the scalar matrices in g tilde. And so what we'll do is we'll let k sub n be the extension of q adjoin zeta sub l to the n, cut out this time by kernel of rho bar. Um, one thing that I think is helpful to keep in mind that I was kind of struggling with as I was going through this myself is, what is the difference between f sub n and k sub n? f sub n corresponds to the kernel of gq to gl2 of k restricted to the Galois group of q adjoined zeta sub l to the n, whereas k sub n corresponds to the kernel of the map gq to pgl2 of k restricted to that same Galois group. So the only real difference is whether or not we allow scalars, essentially. Are we projective or not? Hey. Okay, so it's kind of simple, actually. All right, so we're going to have to proceed in three cases here, so let's do it. Case one, this is the case where z, um, so z was defined up here, it's the kernel of this map, all right, is not just plus or minus one. It's not just the stupid scalar matrices, not just the dumbest of all scalar matrices. I mean, it is the scalar matrices, but... Okay, in this case, the determinant of z is definitely not equal to one. Uh, and so since add zero row bars z invariance just really consists of add zero row bar in this in this case. Um, we know that add zero row bar one's z invariance must be trivial. That's because z acts trivially on add zero row bar. So its action on add zero row bar one is really the trivial action twisted by the cyclotomic character, which is det row bar, okay? Uh, because det z isn't equal to one though, an element x in add zero row bar one can only be z invariant if it's equal to every single det t times x for every t in z. But if you can just pick a t such that det t isn't one by assumption, right? And so the only way this is true is if x is zero. Um, in other words, this guy is trivial, which is what I'm saying, okay? Anyway, moving back onto the argument. So this guy is trivial. So z is cyclic of order co prime to L by construction. And k sub n over m is an L extension. The reason for that is because q adjoins zeta sub l is m in m, which is in k sub n, which is by definition m adjoins zeta sub l to the n. Okay, so this is an L extension here. And so what that means, because z is cyclic of order co-prime to L, is that z lifts to a subgroup that we will still call z of the Galois group of k sub n over q. Okay, so we can kind of lift z up, all right? Now, we're going to need, still in this case one, another inflation restriction sequence. It goes from 0 to H1, Galois group of Kn Z invariance over Q, to add 0 row bar 1's Z invariance, to H1, Galois group of K sub n over Q, add 0 row bar 1, to H1, Galois group of Kn over Kn Z invariance of add 0 row bar 1. Now, this last term vanishes. The reason for that is this Galois group here has cardinality co-prime to L. Why? Well, z does we already talked about that and this guy is just the lift of z from the previous slide which of course still has cardinality co prime to l okay so this guy has to be trivial because this is this um that's not true of this group right so this has this is co prime to l this isn't um essentially well we're kind of using one little thing here to conclude that this is trivial uh, maybe go back to chapter four. If G is a finite group, then the cardinality of G times the ith cohomology group of GM is trivial for any G module M and for any I bigger than zero. So that's why we're concluding this. Like in particular, if D times M vanishes for some D co-prime to the order of G, which is what we have here, then HIGM must vanish, which is what we're concluding, since it vanishes after multiplication uh, both by D, which is co-prime to the order of G and the order of G, okay, by this fact. So this, this is kind of a basic group cohomology thing. Okay. Co-prime to L, not, so this vanishes. Okay. Uh, we're trying to get that this guy vanishes, remember? Well, we're trying to get that this guy vanishes. Okay. So let's continue. We, what about this guy? Uh, well, that's easy. I mean, the first term in that exact sequence also vanishes because this guy we just proved is trivial. So not very interesting, right? So the remaining term must be zero. In other words, the middle term of that, that inflation restriction sequence on the last side is zero. So H1 of Galois group of Kn over Q adds zero row bar one is trivial. But then that immediately gives you that H1 Galois group of Fn over Q adds zero row bar one is trivial, which is what we're trying to prove. And that's because um, the quotient, so Galois group of Kn over Fn is a subgroup of Galois group of Fn over Q that acts trivially on adds zero row bar one. And so you can actually just apply kind of a new, um, like a modified version of the previous inflation restriction sequence given by 0 to h1 of, I'll write this quotient as Galois group of Kn over Q over Galois group of Kn over Fn, which is just this Galois group, um, to add 0 row bar 1 
it's Gal uh, it's Galois group of K N over F N invariants to H one Galois group of K N over Q add zero row bar one. Okay, um, and so again, the point is like this is just this, and this is trivial because we just proved it, and this is exact, so this is just a subgroup of a trivial group, so it's trivial. All right. Okay, I think that's case one. So we've got this in, in the first case. The second case is where z is plus or minus one and l is bigger than three. In this case, z fixes q adjoins zeta sub l. And so the Galois group of q adjoins zeta sub l over q is a quotient of g and pgl2 of k. If you apply Dixon's theorem, you see that g is either contained in a Borel or has order co-prime to l. That's because the other options in Dixon's theorem don't have a cyclic quotient of order l minus one like we do. Okay. However, the first option is not possible because rho bar is assumed to be irreducible, so this is definitely not contained in a Borel. The second option implies that uh, what we'll call H, which is the Galois group of Fn over Q adjoined zeta sub L, has order co-prime to L. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's essentially given to you. And so H1 of the Galois group of Fn over Q of add zero rho bar one, which is H1 of Galois group of Q adjoined zeta sub L, the N over Qs, um, like the, to the H invariance of add zero rho bar one, so these guys match uh, because of this, um, essentially because like Fn over Q adjoins A sub L isn't contributing anything, okay? However, since add zero row bar one is irreducible, recall this follows from the abs uh, absolute irreducibility of row bar restricted to the Galois group of L. Um, I linked you guys to a, to a page of CSS that talked about that a few slides ago. Okay, because, so in other words, because this is irreducible here, um, this guy here has to be trivial, okay, because he's, um, he's definitely not equal to this, okay? So he's got to be trivial by absolute irreducibility. Well, if this is trivial, then this is trivial. Oh, that's exactly what I've been trying to prove, like, you know, since 10 slides ago, that this H1 is trivial every time. Galois group of Fn over Q adds 0 bar 1. He's trivial again, even in this case. Okay, what about the third case? The third case is where z is plus or minus 1 and l is 3. Let's assume that 3 divides the cardinality of g and that g is not contained in a Borel, or else you can just repeat the case 2 argument that we just did. Again, we have that the Galois group of q adjoins zeta sub 3 over q is a quotient of g, just like we did before, so that g cannot be isomorphic to a5, which leaves the possibility, if you look at Dixon's theorem, that g is pgl2 of k. You may be like, whoa, what happened to the other options? Well, PSL2 of k is simple if k isn't f3. And if k is f3, it's a4, which doesn't have a normal subgroup of index 2 like we do. And additionally, s4 is just PGL2 of f of 3, so that's just this case. So really, the only case left is P g is PGL2 of k. Uh, if k is f3, then s4 is PGL2 of f3, which is the Galois group of n over q. That does have a normal subgroup, v4, in, uh, in the Galois group of n over l. This is the unique zero 2 subgroup of this guy. Um, this is like a group, this is just like a thing you learn in abstract algebra. Okay, since the Galois group of Fn over n is a three group, this V4, um, this V4 kind of lifts to a normal subgroup of Galois group of Fn over L. This is similar to how we lifted that group Z earlier, okay? But rho bar restricted to the Galois group of L is absolutely irreducible. And so the V4 invariants of add zero rho bar one, which are obviously not add zero rho bar one itself, these must be trivial. And then you can use an inflation restriction sequence just like we did before to finish the proof in the exact same way, kind of like we did in case, uh, was, that, was that case two or one? Kind of like we did in case one. Okay, so you kind of like use a subgroup lifting argument again with inflation restriction. Okay, what if, uh, so what if not? So the only really remaining case then, like so, so we just took care, so G is PGL2 of K and we just took care of the case K is F3. The only other case by Dixon's theorem would be that G is PGL2 of K and K is F3 to the R where R is bigger than one. So what we need to prove then is that H1 of the Galois group of F0 um, over Q adjoins A sub three to add zero row bar tensored up to K bar over K is trivial. Uh, this is a quick calculation carried out in Klein Partial Scott, cohomology of finite groups of Lie type one, table 4.5. I read it, it's written up very nicely there. I don't feel the need to rehash it here. You can also see Diamond, Darman, Taylor, Lemma 2.48. Okay. And so, um, well, I guess I should say one thing. If this is trivial, okay, then that gives me that, where is it? That this guy is trivial. 
which is what I've been trying to prove in all three cases. Okay, and so I'm, I'm all set. Okay, uh, so I think we've now shown in all cases that psi, that, that non-trivial psi we started with, psi of the Galois group of F sub n is non-trivial no matter what. So how do you finish? It's kind of a neat argument. Uh, what we've seen then is that psi, on the one hand, isn't zero, okay, and, and as, it's not zero where, as an element of homomorphisms from the Galois group of Fn to add zero row bar ones, Galois group of Fn over Q invariance. Now, again, using this for like the 10th time, since row bar restricted to the Galois group of L is absolutely irreducible, so is row bar restricted to the Galois group of Q adjoining zeta sub L to the N and add zero row bar one. Again, I've already talked about this a couple times. This proof, you can see page 441 of CSS for a quick argument for this stuff. And so if we think of psi of the Galois group of F sub n as a GQ submodule of add zero row bar one, which we certainly can, uh, this submodule must be all of add zero row bar one by absolute irreducibility, okay? All right, so now we finish like this. We claim that there exists a sigma naught in the Galois group of Q adjoined zeta sub L to the n, such that row bar of sigma naught has distinct eigenvalues, let's call them alpha and beta. If not, then row bar of the Galois group of Q adjoined zeta sub L to the n is contained in the subgroup of upper triangular matrices. The reason for that is if no element of the image of row bar has distinct eigenvalues, so kind of if this isn't true, um, then the projective image of row bar has exponent L. That's because everything will be similar to like AA01, and these guys definitely have L order. Okay. However, PGL2 of K has an L CELO subgroup consisting of the unipotent matrices, and so the projective image of row bar um, is contained in the group of unipotent matrices up to conjugacy. But another way of saying that is the image of row bar is contained in the subgroup of upper triangular matrices, which is what I claimed was true, right? Okay, um, so what does that tell you? Well, one possibility is that this image, row bar of the Gawa group of Q adjoined zeta sub L to the N is contained in like a torus, but that would make row bar dihedral, which contradicts the irreducibility of row bar restricted to G sub L used for like the hundredth time. So the only other possibility is that this image, row bar, Galois group, Q adjoins A sub L to the N, has a unique invariant line. Well, that would tell you that this image is row bar invariant, but that contradicts the irreducibility of row bar. Okay, and so if you assume that this sigma naught doesn't exist, you're just toast no matter what. Okay, and so the sigma naught has to exist. Okay, so we can always find a sigma naught in the Galois group of Q adjoined zeta sub L to the N such that its image under row bar has distinct eigenvalues, and we'll call those alpha and beta. So what are the eigenvalues of sigma naught on at zero row bar this time? Well, we, I, we've talked about this two or three times, this proof, uh, that you take the quotients of the eigenvalues um, that you started with, alpha and beta, and then you also have one, okay? But uh, sigma naught fixes zeta sub L, so these must also be the eigenvalues of sigma naught on add zero row bar one, the Tate twist, okay, because we're, we're not worried about the cyclotomic twist here, okay. This means that sigma naught minus one, add zero row bar one, cannot be all of add zero row bar one, okay. We have like actual interesting eigenvalues on this space of sigma naught, so these cannot be equal to each other. Well, that tells me that psi of the, uh, of the Galois group of F sub n can't be contained here, Okay, because it's, um, because what do we know about it? Because of this sentence right here. If psi of Galois group of F sub n as a GQ submodule of this Tate twist, if we think of it like that, then this submodule has to be the whole thing. Okay, well, if it's the whole thing and these aren't equal, then it can't be contained here, right? Okay, all right, we're just about done. There's a cute trick to finish. For tau in the Galois group of F sub n, let sigma now be tau sigma naught. Tau acts trivially on add zero row bar and add zero row bar of one by construction. Since row bar of tau is scalar, the matrix row bar of sigma still has distinct eigenvalues and, and sigma leaves the L to the nth roots of unity invariant and all this is just because sigma naught does and, and tau acts trivially. So um, it suffices then, like really, if you go back up and look at what we have to check, Let's go back up and look at this. Man, this was so long ago. Where was <laughs> this proof is so long? Uh, okay, so we're here, right? So we've kind of taken care of this stuff, right? So really, we just have to make sure of this stuff for the sigma we just found, all right? So let's go back down. Woo. Okay. So we just have to check that psi of sigma, which is tau psi of sigma naught plus psi of tau, which is psi of sigma naught plus sigma of tau. 
because tau acts trivially on this. Um, we have to check that this isn't in sigma minus 1 of add 0 rho bar 1, which, by the way, that's just sigma not minus 1 of add 0 rho bar 1. Okay. But the point is this. Like, it could just be that this isn't here when sigma is just sigma 0, right? And then we would be done. But if sigma equals sigma 0 doesn't work, then by what we just got done proving up here, we could find a tau in the Galois group of f sub n such that psi of tau translates psi of sigma naught out of this space. Oh, great. In other words, psi of sigma equals sigma naught tau has this property then, which is what I'm trying to prove. So either sigma naught works or some translate of it by some tau in the Galois group does the job for us. Okay. And all of that is because this image isn't contained here, which is what like most of what we proved today dealt with. All right. So that's way enough time spent on this, but this is like a huge proposition to me. This is one of the most magical, like linchpinny things of the entire proof of R equals T is that there's this like magic R that works for all of these integers, all of these finite sets of primes at once. And somehow you can always generate the, this, this universal type Q sub n deformation ring by the same number of elements R no matter what n is. Okay, so that's pretty wild. Um, and so I think we have uh, Proposition 5 that we'll start looking at next video. And so I'll see you all then, and thanks for watching.